What's up, Cole? My name is Jack Neal, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, disturbing, and morbid. In today's video, we have three stories of students who killed their teachers, and the cases gradually get more disturbing. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button, or else. Let's get into today's video. And don't forget, look behind you. October 22nd, 2013. Halloween is fast approaching and the halls of Danvers High School are filled with the excited chatter of its students. Everyone's in good spirits as they go about their day, everyone except 14-year-old Philip Chisholm. Philip's a new face in Danvers, Massachusetts, and he's having some issues adjusting after moving away from his hometown in Tennessee. He's a quiet kid, but not exactly what you'd call a loner. In the short time he's been here at Danvers High, he's already made a couple of friends and joined the soccer team. However, the stress of his parents' ongoing divorce is taking a toll on him, and he seems particularly quiet as he takes a seat in Colleen Ritzer's classroom. 24-year-old Colleen is new to Danvers herself. She's worked here as a math teacher for about two years now, but has quickly become one of the students' favorite teachers. She's actually passionate about what she teaches and has a rare talent for making sure kids can easily understand the concepts she teaches when dealing with difficult problems or equations. She's the kind of teacher that wakes up every single morning super fired up and ready to go that extra mile for a struggling kid and wants nothing more but to make a difference in their lives. The bell rings and she asks one of her students to stay behind after class so they can chat for a little bit. Colleen has a knack for picking up on which students need a little bit of extra help and the new kid, Philip, seems like he could really use it. Another student drops by to visit her favorite teacher and overhears their conversation. At first, everything seems perfectly normal. Colleen asks Philip if he misses Tennessee, however, he gets upset, really upset. She smoothly transitions from the subject, which appears to calm him down, but soon after, the other student notices Philip mumbling something to himself. Colleen gets up from her chair, and the school security camera catches her exiting her classroom and walking down the hallway before waving to someone and giving them a big smile. Then, she disappears into the bathroom. The footage seems normal, wholesome almost, but it begins to feel a bit strange when you realize she won't be alive for much longer. Seconds later, Philip slips into the hallway and follows her. He's been wearing a red hoodie all day, but for some odd reason, he decides to change into a blue one. He pauses just long enough to pull his hood up over his head and puts on a pair of gloves. The CCTV video from inside the bathroom clearly shows the moment he walks in, but the attack itself occurs in a blind spot, hidden away from the camera's watchful eye. But that doesn't mean nobody saw it. They just didn't know what they were looking at. 11 minutes pass by and another student walks in and glimpses briefly to see what appears to be a naked woman in the bathroom. The student, completely unaware of the horrible things happening before her eyes, assumes that she simply barged in on someone changing and rushes back into the hallway. Philip leaves immediately after and it's at this point that Colleen Ritzer is on the brink of death. Now, we can't be sure exactly what happened in that bathroom, but what we do know is it was brutal. Philip thought he'd planned the murder pretty well, similar to most teenage killers, but what he'd failed to think through was the whole hide the body in evidence part. He attempts to hide his face from the camera as he walks out of the building, which only makes his guilt more obvious. He disposes of Colleen's clothes before heading back to her classroom where he grabs his backpack and her purse. He dumps her bag in the recycling bin before heading back to the bathroom and seeing a friend of his along the way. They'd actually made plans earlier that day to hang out at the soccer field, but Philip had never shown up. The friend stops him and asks what's going on, and later tells investigators that Philip was covered in sweat and looked absolutely terrified. Philip then wheels the trash can into the bathroom and puts Colleen's body inside. He puts on a ski mask, rolls the trash can out of the building, and stashes her in the woods behind the school and partially covers up her body with leaves. When police find her, the horrific extent of her injuries brings many of them to tears. Her neck's been cut several times with a box cutter and there's evidence of recent sexual trauma, likely with a foreign object. A note lies next to her body reading, I hate you all. Armed with the overwhelming evidence of his guilt, police apprehend Philip Chisholm and quickly put him on trial where he claims that Colleen said a trigger word, Tennessee, which sent him into a sudden murderous rage. 
It's a pretty hard story to buy though. Someone that kills in the spur of the moment probably isn't going to premeditate with multiple changes of clothes, gloves, and definitely not a ski mask. Given that he's underage, Philip can't be sentenced to life in prison under Massachusetts law, so instead he's convicted of sexual assault, armed robbery, and first degree murder, receiving a 40 year sentence. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not quite sure if the sentence matches the crime. Here we have a 14 year old kid with a working knowledge of morality committing a crime that was both premeditated and grisly in nature. Then we have Colleen. She was a kind woman with an open heart. She had dreams of making a real impact on her students and this had just recently become a reality. There's really no limit to how many futures she could have shaped or how much brighter her students could have shined through her love, empathy, and guidance. A few months before her death, Colleen posted a tweet that summed up her life better than I ever could. No matter what happens in life, be good to people. Being good to people is a wonderful legacy to leave behind. While Colleen's life ended under the worst possible circumstances, that will never become who she really was. The legacy her students and loved ones remember is one of genuine kindness, warmth, and compassion. It's November 3rd, 2021, and 66-year-old Nohima Graber is taking an afternoon stroll after a long day of teaching Spanish to high schoolers. She regularly hikes through Chautauqua Park after school lets out, but on this particular walk, she disappears. A few hours after the beloved educator and mother of three is reported missing, the police find her body in the park covered with a tarp, a wheelbarrow, and some railroad ties. They determined that she suffered some type of massive head trauma, ultimately leading to her death. The residents of Fairfield, Iowa are sent reeling. Who could possibly have some motive to hurt such a positive light in their community? She was one of those teachers to proudly show off cards and letters that she'd received from former students at Fairfield High, where she'd been teaching Spanish for nine years. It's impossible for them to imagine how such a wonderful person could meet such a gruesome fate. It doesn't take long for investigators to find the murderer, though, and the news shakes everyone to their core. A 16-year-old boy named Willard Miller admits to watching his friend, Jeremy Goodell, attack Mrs. Graber with a baseball bat before taking her life and helping conceal the body. Around this time, while the local community is still trying to process the idea that a pair of teenagers could commit such a brutal crime, a witness that knows Jeremy but didn't partake in the killing comes forward with a conversation they shared together on Snapchat. These chilling messages detail every aspect of the murder from the plan to the attack, ending with the boy's attempt to cover it all up afterward. However, in spite of their initial efforts to conceal the corpse, the boys are tempted to tell someone, anyone. Why? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but the two most likely scenarios are the boys are looking to brag about the murder of Mrs. Graber, or they simply cannot take the mental gymnastics that is dealing with that level of guilt. And while I know these motives reveal two very different perspectives on the boys, the best I can give you is my theories because many details of the case are still sealed up. A classmate of Willard and Jeremy mentions overhearing a heated argument one of the boys had with Mrs. Graber over a bad grade that they wanted changed. Another student mentions Willard became particularly aggressive when talking about his dislike of his Spanish teacher. When the boys' homes are searched, they find the blood-soaked clothes that they wore on that night, as well as the baseball bat used in the killing. During Willard's line of questioning, he admits that he was the one to supply the wheelbarrow, and witnesses describe seeing a male figure pushing a wheeled object through the park at around midnight on November 2nd. Security footage shows Mrs. Graber pulling into the park on November 2nd at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon for her usual walk. 40 minutes pass by and someone can be seen getting into our car and driving away with a pickup truck following closely behind. At this point, it's pretty clear what happened and who's responsible. The boys are arrested and held on a million dollar bond. Almost immediately, the defense team moves to have the boys tried as juveniles because if convicted, they would serve less than two years in a correctional facility before being released at the age of 18. However, this idea doesn't sit too well with the judge of the case, and he decides to have them tried as adults instead. 
But despite the boys being treated as adults in the eyes of the court, it's very unlikely that they'll spend life behind bars due to Iowa law. Essentially, these laws prevent the court from sentencing someone under the age of 18 to life in prison without parole because they see it as cruel and unusual punishment. The exact amount of time they're set to serve is still unknown, but luckily the case takes place in a few months, so we'll know pretty soon. In the meantime though, a community is still grieving. They're trying to turn a tragic event into a positive outcome. The student council and faculty at Fairfield High organized a fundraising walk to honor the park that she loved so much. It took place just last month and the proceeds went to a scholarship fund set up in Mrs. Graber's name. The horrific death of Nohima Graber is a hard thing to come to terms with because we, her family, and the community still know little about what drives a couple of teenagers to do something so brutal. But what we do know is that as these killers sit behind bars, they're staring down the possibility of spending the rest of their lives in prison. Whatever's going on in those boys' heads is anybody's guess, but I sincerely hope they feel some sort of remorse. Before I get into today's final story, I'm super excited to tell you guys about Hunt a Killer. This murder mystery box is one of the most unique and challenging games I've played in my entire life. It was really cool putting my detective skills to use and it's actually really fun to play with your friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, family, whoever. I know my sister and I are probably gonna play it in a few weeks and I am stoked. Honestly, it feels super similar to escape rooms and they give you pieces of evidence and basically send you down this rabbit hole of what it really feels like to solve a true crime case. If you wanna check it out, go to huntakiller.com backslash Jack Neal. Make sure you use my link though because you get a $10 discount, so it'd be kinda of silly not to. Anyway, let's get back to the video. It's May 26, 2000 and the students of Lake Worth Middle School eagerly await the last bell of the year. 13-year-old Nathaniel Brazil arrives with a bouquet of flowers to give his crush to leave a lasting impression on her before summer break begins. Nathaniel's in really high spirits, although saying goodbye feels a little bittersweet, especially since a few days ago, his crush had given him his very first kiss. Pretty much everyone in school gets along with Nate. He's an honor student, but his grades have been slipping a bit lately since his mom's been recently diagnosed with breast cancer. He's the type of kid to watch over the rest of the class while the teacher steps out for a minute, but still, lately, he's been going through a lot. Luckily though, today seems like a perfect opportunity to let off a little bit of steam. Everyone is anxiously awaiting the sound of the bell, but it's drowned out by a gunshot. 35-year-old Barry Gruno, Nathaniel's favorite teacher, is the victim, and the killer? Well, it's the same mild-mannered kid who a few hours ago was carrying a bouquet of flowers, but is now carrying a 25 caliber handgun. Now, what events could have possibly taken place to turn a seemingly innocent kid into a cold-blooded killer? Well, it starts with a water balloon fight. Nate and his friends are throwing them back and forth at each other in the cafeteria, but the fun comes to an end when they're escorted out of the building and suspended from the school. As they're making their way out with the assistant principal, one of Nathaniel's friends overhears him say something along the lines of killing the assistant principal. He's infuriated for kicking him out and not giving him the chance to say goodbye to his crush. Nathaniel then proceeds to go home, steal his grandfather's handgun, and make his way back into the school. However, when he enters the building, he heads to Mr. Grono's classroom where his crush is sitting among her fellow English students. The teacher answers the door and Nathaniel demands that his friends be allowed in the hall so he can give them a proper goodbye. Mr. Grono calmly refuses his offer but suggests that he come into the classroom and chat with them here. But Nate's the kind of kid that conceals his emotion. Not really the best at expressing himself, so being vulnerable in front of people that he barely knows is practically impossible. Nathaniel then proceeds to raise the gun in the air and asks again if he can speak with his friends in private. But despite literally staring death in the face, Mr. Grono calmly refuses his offer and again invites Nate inside. Nathaniel cocks the hammer. Mr. Grono stands his ground. The gun goes off. To everyone's horror, the beloved teacher and father of two falls to the floor with a bullet in his head with Nathaniel's crush and her friends standing right next to him. It takes a second, but Nate soon begins to process the caliber of what he's done, so he bolts. As he's running, he sees a passing teacher, points the gun at them, but doesn't shoot. 
He leaves the building and collapses not far down the street where an officer finds him. He immediately confesses, telling him everything, and is charged with first-degree murder. When the senseless killing hits the news, it sparks a controversial debate. When it comes to juvenile killers like Nathaniel, should the state of Florida consider adult-sized punishments for minors who make adult-sized mistakes? Is a life sentence an appropriate punishment for a seventh grader? During the trial, Nathaniel seems numb and appears emotionless. His defense team argues that he never actually meant to pull the trigger. As for the fact that he brought a gun to the school in the first place, well, according to a child psychologist that testifies and the testimony of his mother, Nate had a pretty traumatic childhood. He grew up watching his mother be physically abused by multiple husbands and boyfriends, and as he got older, he would intervene to protect his mom. Having spent many of his formative years in a violent, abusive environment, it would be reasonable to assume that he had no other blueprint for getting his way than intimidation. And what's more intimidating than a gun? Further, Nate's lawyer argues that he didn't mean to kill his favorite teacher. In fact, Mr. Grunnell was the only person he trusted as evidenced by a letter Nathaniel had written to him describing his suicidal thoughts. He never intended to pull the trigger and was under the impression that the safety was on. All he wanted was to say goodbye to his friends. To a troubled 13-year-old kid, it may have seemed like a good idea at the time, and as far as the comments about the assistant principal, probably just a kid's false bravado. However, the witnesses, as well as his classmates, are not convinced. Many of them ask for the maximum sentence. The jury, however, throws out the first-degree charge in favor of a second-degree conviction, and on May 16, 2001, Nathaniel Brazil is sentenced to 28 years in prison. The judge also orders Nate to attend anger management classes while getting his general education degree while behind bars. After release, he's set to have two additional years of house arrest, followed by five years of probation, and after that, maybe a glimmer of hope for rehabilitation. He'll be eligible for release when he's in his early 40s. Plenty of time to start over and begin a new life, right? Honestly, I doubt it, but the debate still continues. If juveniles are tried the same way as adults, by the time they've grown up, they've spent so much of their life in the prison system that the chances of rehabilitation are quite low. On the other hand, some argue Nathaniel's sentence was too lenient. Serious crimes need serious sentences, and a student pulling a loaded gun on a teacher is serious. Was this perfect storm of immature impulse combined with childhood trauma an excuse for Nate to take the life of someone he cared deeply about, or should he lose a good chunk of his life for taking someone else's? Let me know your guys' thoughts, and as always, stay spooky, YouTube.